I'm Peter Drummey, the librarian of the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I want to welcome you here this evening. Our program for this evening, Sweet Boston, is the fourth in our series, Cooking Boston. Before we begin, let me remind you that the work of the Massachusetts Historical Society is supported by its members. And if you are not a member, let me encourage you to join the society and participate in all of its programs and activities. To moderate our program for this evening, Sweet Boston, and introduce our speakers, um, I will turn this program over to Gavin Cleesby's, the MHS Director of Programs. But first, let me just ask you, as I'm about to do, is to turn off your cell phone. And uh, at the end of the discussion, there's going to be opportunity, at least for a, a brief period, of asking questions, but we'll show you how we're going to do that at the end of the program. Thank you. Gavin? Thanks, Peter. Um, so I think uh, I've met many of you before, and I'm normally the person in Peter's role, uh, so it's unusual for me to be on the stage. Uh, but this time, uh, we're talking about candy, and candy is something that I, I have a deep love for. Um, so just to give you a general sense of uh, how the evening is going to progress, um, I'm going to do a first uh, brief introduction that should be about five minutes, uh, looking at some of the famous uh, candy manufacturers uh, in the Boston area. Uh, we'll then uh, turn it over to our speakers, and I'll introduce each speaker um, as they come up so that you don't have to remember who everyone is uh, throughout the course of the whole evening. Uh, but in essence, um, our program will go with uh, Joyce Chaplin speaking um, on the history of agriculture and food uh, in relation to the environment and sugar and consumption in New England, uh, followed by Michael Crondall, who, speak, who will speak about something near and dear to the heart of all New Englanders, which is donuts. Uh, and that will be followed by uh, Carla Martin, uh, who will look at the late colonial and contemporary coffee, coffee chocolate houses in Boston, uh, as well as contemporary chocolatiers, ethics related to uh, purchasing of chocolates and the pioneers in fair trade. Um, so to get started, um, Boston and Cambridge uh, were once the largest center of candy production in the country. Uh, beginning in 1765 with an Irish immigrant named John Hannon, who established America's first chocolate mill on the banks of the Neponset River in Dorchester with the help of physician uh, James Baker. Um, Baker took over the factory from Han Hannon's widow uh, in 1790, uh, and the company was eventually renamed Baker's Chocolate. <coughs> uh, this chocolate is, of course, still available today in most grocery stores uh, around, uh, although is no longer made in New England. The heyday of candy production in the area was probably from the 1920s to the early 1950s. Uh, in that period, Main Street in Cambridge was known as Confectioner's Row, uh, and there were over 100 different brands of candy made in Boston and Cambridge. Uh, just to take a quick look at some of the better known and some of the lesser known varieties, um, probably the most familiar is Necco. Um, Necco was founded in 1847 by Oliver Chase, who patented a lozenge cutting, lozenge cutting machine. In 1901, Chase and company merged with two other Boston-based producers to become the New England Confectionery Company, uh, and the familiar Necco wafer brand was born in 1912. Originally located in Boston, Necco moved to Cambridge in 1927. Uh, when it opened, it claimed to be the largest uh, confectioner manufacturing facility uh, in the world. Um, I don't think it held that title for very long, but it at least claimed that. Um, they uh, remained in operation in Central Square until 2004, uh, when it moved productions and headquarters to Revere, uh, and the building was purchased by uh, Novartis uh, Biomedical Research, who spent $175 million uh, converting the building from candy manufacturing into a biotech uh, research facility. Um, Shrafton <coughs> Company is also, of course, one of the more uh, well-known or well-remembered. Uh, it began making gumdrops in 1861. They expanded to making candy, chocolate, ice cream, and cakes, and by the end of the 19th century, began opening restaurants. Um, their landmark location in Charlestown opened the year after Necco's in Cambridge, uh, and within a short period of time, also claimed to be the largest candy manufacturer in the world. Um, so sometimes you have to wonder about those claims. Uh, by the mid-1950s, uh, their restaurant chain had expanded to over 50 locations up and down the eastern seaboard. Um, unfortunately, by the late 1960s, uh, they were purchased uh, by Pet Milk Company, uh, broken up into multiple different smaller companies, uh, and witnessed about a 15-year decline before closing in 1981. Uh, their landmark <coughs> building still stands, uh, but is now office space. Um, to get into some of the lesser-known companies that might be kind of fun to explore, uh, Fox Cross Candy 
um, was located in Cambridge. They had uh, an, an unusual start. Uh, Donley Cross uh, was a Shakespearean stage actor in San Francisco uh, in the early 1900s. During one performance, he fell off stage and seriously injured his back, thereby ending his Shakespearean career. Um, he then decided that the logical step was to become a candy manufacturer. <laughs> so he teamed up with his friend Charlie, Fro Charlie Fox uh, and opened Fox Cross Company in, in 1920. Uh, they launched with a, a new candy bar called the New Chew, uh, which didn't go down in history as being particularly famous. Uh, but in 1922, uh, they took vanilla flavored nougat, covered it with milk chocolate, and created the Charleston Chew, which is still available today. Uh, the name was based on the popularity of the dance at the time, so it had nothing to do with Charleston, Massachusetts, um, and was originally based on the West Coast. Uh, they eventually sold the business in 1931. It moved uh, to Cambridge, uh, taking over the building uh, for the Boston Confectionery Company pictured on the screen. Uh, the building still stands today and is now the home of MIT Press. Um, <clears throat> one of the bigger companies was Daggett Chocolates. Um, Fred Daggett opened Daggett Chocolates in 1892 in Boston. Uh, he, at one point, had multiple different factories around the city. Uh, in 1925, he consolidated his operations in one plant in Cambridge. Um, they became a huge company with multiple different brands, many of which people may remember, such as Page and Shaw. Um, they had, uh, I think, up to 40 different brands at their height. Um, and they were a, a tremendously vertically integrated company, so they not only owned their chocolate factory in Cambridge, but they owned uh, strawberry fields in Virginia uh, and processing plants in Virginia where they turned the, the fruits that they grew into the fillings for their candies, uh, and then also sold those fillings to ice cream stores to use on top of ice creams. Um, they also owned the plants that made the boxes and the companies that printed all their labels, so they were a completely vertically integrated company. Um, however, uh, by the late 1950s, Fred Daggett died, uh, and the company survived for a couple more years, but closed by the early 1960s, uh, and was eventually sold to NECO, um, and the buildings were sold to MIT, which they still stand, um, and sort of ironically are now wafer, wafer, fa or wafer manufacturing facilities. But I think they're talking about different types of wafers. Um, one of the also very popular brands that people remember uh, was the Squirrel Nut Company. Uh, it was originally started in 1890 um, as the Austin T. Merrill Company in Roxbury. It was renamed in 1899 uh, as Squirrel Brand Salted Nut Company uh, and started a, a relatively rapid growth. Uh, it relocated to Cambridge in 1903 and built a new facility in 1915 uh, where they premiered their flagship uh, product, the Squirrel Nut Zipper, uh, which uh, was supposedly named for an illegal drink that was popular during Prohibition. Um, eventually, uh, Hollis Garish, the third owner of the company, died in the mid-1990s um, and in his will said that the company should be liquidated. Uh, so the property was sold off and the squirrel brand was sold to Southern Style Nuts um, and moved to Texas. Uh, the building still stands, however, on Boardman Street in Cambridge and is today condos. Um, there is also worth mentioning one company left uh, in Cambridge that does still manufacture candy. Uh, founded as the James Welch Company. It started in 1927 and made Junior Mints, Sugar Daddies, Sugar Mamas, and Sugar Babies, among other candies. Um, it was bought by Nabisco in 1963, and James Welch uh, became the director of Nabisco until uh, 1978. His son actually also went on to be the president of Nabisco. Uh, Welch brands were then sold uh, to Warner Lambert in 1988, and finally to Tootsie Roll Industries in 1993. Uh, Tootsie Rolls Industry still uh, owns the facility and runs the plant, so if you happen to be on Main Street in Cambridge and you're walking and you smell Junior Mints, there's a, there's a reason for that. Um, and they, they produce, um, I don't think all the Junior Mints in the world, but I think the majority of Junior Mints come out of that plant, so literally millions of Junior Mints a day. Um, as just an interesting side note to end this little uh, short tour of some of the fun candy maker, makers in the area, um, uh, James Welch's brother was named Robert. Robert actually owned a competing uh, candy manufacturer in Cambridge uh, called the Oxford Candy Company uh, that went bankrupt in the Great Depression. Uh, Robert then worked for his brother James um, at James Welch and Company uh, until 1956 when he left and uh, shifted completely out of can the candy business into politics uh, and in 1958 founded the John Birch Society, a radical right-wing anti-communist group. So it does go to show that uh, if your candy doesn't work out, things really can turn sour relatively quickly. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. So.
So this is a relatively brief overview of some of the uh, candy factories that were in the area. Um, we're now, we'll delve a little bit more deeply into some of the story of candy making uh, and chocolate making and other confections in the area. Uh, we'll first turn it over to Joyce Chaplin. Uh, Joyce is the James Duncan Phillips Professor of Early American History at Harvard. Uh, she is a former Fulbright Scholar and has taught at five different universities on two continents and an island. Um, and in maritime studies program uh, on the Atlantic Ocean. She is most interested in topics where humans and nature meet, including subjects in early American history, intellectual history, and the history of science. So without further ado, I will turn it over to her. Thank you. Um, and perhaps because I was teaching a whole course on American food this semester, I think I forgot which part of that I was supposed to be talking about tonight. <laughs> um, so I come to you uh, with some remarks about ice cream, but that enormous topic uh, I think can take a little taste of what the larger panel um, uh, to come will be. Um, and I was going to start by um, with an anecdote about an incident that took place in Paris during the American Revolution. Um, at that point, John Adams and Benjamin Franklin were both serving as ambassadors to the French court in order to sustain and expand French support of the American War for Independence. And um, Adams arrived after Franklin had been in place for some years and has really taken charge <laughs> of the whole mission, which Adams resented. Um, and famously, Adams disapproved especially of the way that Franklin used sociability and entertainment to solidify Franco-American relations, have people over for dinner um, all the time. Adams thought Franklin was extravagant in his spending on um, this, and in particular, he accused Franklin of luxury, unbecoming a citizen of a republic, especially in what was served to eat at Franklin's entertainments, to which Franklin responded that this was ridiculous. They only had ices on weekends. <laughs> I, I doubt that calmed Adams down <laughs> at all, uh, but that was Franklin's sense of how you exercised economy, um, that you had this strange, luxurious thing to eat, but only on the weekends. Um, and thus, these two Boston boys, um, Franklin and Adams were both from families from around here for a long time, so these two Boston boys quarreled about one of the weirdest foods in history but also one of the most delicious um, and one firmly, if strangely, rooted in the food cultures of Boston. The two main points that I want to make um, in the time that I have are first, that ice cream is an unnatural food that is not essential to the human diet. <laughs> and second, that Bostonians, like small children everywhere, somehow know this <laughs> and therefore want to eat ice cream early and often the way that Chicagoans used to cast ballots in elections. <laughs> so the first proposition, that ice cream is an unnatural food that is not essential to the human diet. We do not need to eat frozen foods. <laughs> we might need what is in ice cream. Sure, milk provides protein and sugar has carbohydrates, and there might be fruit in there somewhere. It doesn't need to be frozen. It just doesn't need to be. Everyone's nodding. So now you already know when you want ice cream, it's unnatural. <laughs> we don't need frozen foods. And yet this desire to savor frozen treats, this amazing sensation that they provide, goes back way back to ancient times when Persians, Indians, Romans, and others sipped iced concoctions such as sherbet, shabbat, the Persian word for a frozen delicacy based on fruit, water, flowers. Ice cream, uh, which depends on a dairy substrate, usually cow, but it doesn't have to be. Um, this comes later, um, mostly in Europe, and it became especially famous in Italy and associated with Naples in particular. So the Neapolitan ice cream seller um, becomes a stock European type, and Italians are often credited with inventing ice cream, simplifying a more complicated story, but associating, you see already, this, this strange way in which ice cream is unnatural. People eat this ice thing in hot climates, um, where it's actually hard uh, to get the materials to make it that cold. Um, uh, so it's refreshing in that climate, but a lot of bother. It takes a lot of effort. No one needs to eat this food. It is always surplus to requirements by definition. 
And indeed, creating food with ice arguably makes ice cream the very first dish in the history of molecular gastronomy. Molecular gastronomy or modernist cuisine, those techniques um, uh, developed in the early 20th, 21st century um, to uh, use chemistry and other semi-scientific procedures to make edible ingredients into a series of lovely tricks uh, that happen to be eaten, tricks and puzzles. So meat is made into foam, of course. Chocolate dessert is made to resemble the humus-rich floor of an arboreal forest, which of course we've always wanted to eat. Um, <laughs> The kitchen sends forth aquamarine, aquamarine pools of something from which diners fish out, uh, fish out fish-shaped objects that don't taste like fish. Um, so a series of tricks that are edible, but they seem wondrous and not quite like food. Um, this was the modernist cuisine or molecular gastronomy associated with Ibuli um, in Catalonia, uh, Noma in Copenhagen, and a series of other now defunct restaurants. Um, WD-40 in New York City, Sepia in Sydney, Australia, all of which are, were places that offered you foam and forest floor and all of these other things. Now, modernist cuisine or molecular gastronomy owes a debt, especially to the futurist cookbook um, of the Italian futurists, especially Marinetti. Um, uh, the Futurist Cookbook taught you how to eat food that, again, was surplus to requirements. It was not just ingesting calories. Uh, Marinetti had it in for spaghetti, for instance. He was an Italian who said that this is a barbarous food that should not be eaten. Um, a riot broke out, or a fight broke out between two competing restaurants far off in San Francisco over the fact um, that uh, the Futurists had denounced spaghetti, and instead were saying that people could eat small amounts of unusual substances while blindfolded, so they wouldn't exactly know what it was, but they could taste it. Meanwhile, they would be stroking something. Maybe it was sandpaper or velvet. Optimally, this would be done on an airplane, right? Just to make it <laughs> clear that it was otherworldly. Um, so again, food that is not supplying a daily need. Um, <clears throat> food that is simply a kind of art, a pleasure, um, a way of ingesting something that is not actually necessary. But ice cream got there first um, by using ice and salt. Ice cream makers of the pre-modern period and then afterward used chemistry to transform, transform liquids into solids and to even to turn stuff that had once been hot from the cow, right? <laughs> Milk into something icy in the mouth. Um, it's not natural, small children instinctively know this. They think and they silently say to themselves, I don't need to eat this. I don't have to eat this. <laughs> Therefore, I want to eat this, <laughs> in contrast to everything else that they're supposed to eat. But Bostonians wanted ice cream too. Um, in this puritanical place, all brown bread, beans, and practicality, the desire for sweet treats, and eventually icy sweet treats, has a long, long history. Um, iced confections can take many forms and be made from many things, and they have many ingredients, but their most essential ingredients are sugar and ice. They need to be sweet, they need to be frozen. So I'll talk about Boston's food history in relation to these two items that go into all kinds of ice cream. First of all, sugar. New Englanders, and my panelists will help me support this, definitely, um, and expand on it. Um, New Englanders have had a sweet tooth since the 17th century. This is well documented that New Englanders were importing sugar, bringing it with them when they came. Correspondence, recipes, descriptions of foods eaten, medicines, um, trade records about the importation and consumption of sugar make it clear that this is a taste that the English already had in the 17th century, and people who came to New England were not going to give that up. Later, New England and Boston in particular would have extremely strong commercial links to the sugar-producing islands of the Caribbean, um, the English colonies in the islands that produce sugar on a commercial scale using slave labor. It's famous um, that Bostonians imported rum, um, uh, sorry, molasses to make into rum. That was a big commercial industry, especially in the 18th century. They were also importing sugar, even at that point, for confectionery, usually not for things as sweet as we would like them now, but it was already a taste. People knew that that was what you wanted, probably, to put into baked goods, 
to stir into your tea, into your, well, maybe not tea, well, tea for a while, um, and then not tea, coffee, um, um, and chocolate, as we ha have just eaten. Um, so that connection with the West Indies made it easier to get sugar um, and established certain economic strengths uh, for the New England colonies, and again, especially Boston. This meant that New England and Boston had very strong connections to slavery uh, that are still coming to light now. We're realizing now that even though this was not a place with a lot of commercial use of slave labor, the economy in New England was dependent on that far off um, uh, presence. Uh, so the connections to slavery are the bitterest part um, of Bostonians' taste for sugar. It also um, shows that there was a hemispheric um, circulation of sugar um, uh, and an economy that drew not only the New England colonies into contact up and down the seaboard to um, the West Indian colonies, but then across the Atlantic, um, where most of the sugar was exported. So Boston had a place within a hemispheric economy reaching well beyond New England itself, but with Boston at the center. So that's sugar, that one ingredient in the history of it, um, as it would be coming into New England via mostly Boston at the start and supplying an increasingly popular and coveted part of the diet onto ice. As global warming proceeds, um, New England winters, except for the occasional um, climate change generated snowmageddon, um, New England winters are getting milder, um, and we need to kind of recover and remember the historical experience of what climate scientists call the Little Ice Age. New England was settled by European colonists um, and developed into the cities and eventually states um, that we now take as part of the landscape of the United States. Um, all of this occurred during the Little Ice Age, a period of climatic cooling, um, roughly dating from the 1300s and going into the early 1800s. This meant that New, Eng uh, New England winters were even colder uh, than they are now and more routinely cold longer and um, their intervals more snow, um, uh, more cold for everything and everyone. Um, this meant that uh, not only was there plenty of snow and ice, but the ice could be harvested um, as ponds, rivers, and lakes uh, would freeze over. People could take out the ice, um, store it in materials like hay or sawdust, um, and then use it later in warmer months. Um, so one benefit uh, to living in the little ice age was uh, to uh, take some of that cold and enjoy it uh, when it was hot. Um, the ice could be sold to people who, who had not laid up supplies of it, and so there was a regional trade. Um, already by the end of the 18th century, people were trying to store it, and by the early 19th century, sell it to each other. Um, one New England man decided that he was gonna sell it on a large scale, and this is a man named Frederick Tudor, born 1783 after the American Revolution, who lived almost to the end of the Civil War, 1864. A, he was a Boston merchant, who founded the Tudor Ice Company. And the company cut ice for New England ponds, stored it, and sold it. The company began to export it beyond New England, including to Southern American cities, um, with the understanding that maybe people in Savannah would like ice in their drinks come July. Um, then the company began to sell to the Caribbean. <laughs> Um, so just as sugar came into New England from these places, New Englanders eventually sent back ice. Uh, Tudor first exported ice to Martinique in 1803. In 1833, he shipped ice to British India. That's a pretty far way away, especially for a sailing ship. Um, people laughed selling ice to India, uh-huh. <laughs> um, and Tudor must have sweated nearly as much as the ice he sent um, that was slowly shrinking and melting away. Big gamble, um, uh, melting and shrinking on its passage to India, but 100 tons of the ice survived. Um, and it made Tudor a profit of $200,000, um, a calculated $200,000 for 1833, uh, at a conservative estimate, that would be close to $5 million uh, today, so people stopped laughing. Um, one perhaps unexpected statement of admiration about this uh, selling New England ice abroad came from Henry David Thoreau, who saw ice being cut from Walden Pond, where he was living, and he imagined its destiny. 
in his famous book, Walden. He said, thus it appears that the sweltering inhabitants of Charleston and New Orleans, of Madras and Bombay and Calcutta drink at my well. <laughs> the pure Walden water is mixed with the sacred water of the Ganges. It's a nice image. It's sort of an amazing image of globalization for the time, uh, for the first part of the 19th century, to imagine a prosaic New England commodity, water, it happens to be frozen, but water, <laughs> being sold on the other side of the world. Um, so this is a, a realization of the global scale of food production and consumption, again, with Boston at the center. So sugar and ice, put them together, ice cream. And ice cream has remained important to Boston. Um, two now defunct uh, restaurant chains, Schraff's, originally a candy maker, but eventually um, purveyor of ice cream, um, that ran a series of ice cream parlors, mostly in the Northeast. Um, Howard Johnson, slightly later, um, both of these, uh, uh, Howard Johnson's probably the more famous and recent restaurant chain, but originally started by selling ice cream. Both of these Operation Schraff's and Howard Johnson's began in the Boston suburbs. Um, and they still offered ice cream. It was a sort of specialty of these places, even if you were having something else to eat. The ice cream was always there, and everyone kind of understood that that's how these sturdy establishments had started. Um, and at that point, the ice cream parlor and the place where you could go to eat that um, uh, signaled a kind of respectability, especially for women who might want to eat out alone or take a child to have a meal, um, where a restaurant would not be appropriate, fine dining, nor would the kind of establishments that served liquor. Um, so the ice cream parlor became this place where um, a woman uh, could go and eat um, in a public place, and that was perfectly fine because ice cream kept everything respectable. Again, surplus to requirements, but it's an important cultural signal um, that who would eat that in public? Well, ladies, of course. Um, um, it used to be the case that Bostonians topped the scales in per capita uh, consumption of ice cream. This is often widely cited that we're just eating it all the time. It's actually not true anymore. Um, people in Long Beach, California, Dallas, and Philadelphia now eat more ice cream. We're falling behind. If you want to do something about that, you know what to do. We can still claim Ben and Jerry's um, as the region's big contribution to recent ice cream culture. Um, there are left-wing politics atoning, perhaps, for Boston's earlier support of sugar and slavery. Why not go further? Um, maybe all Boston ice cream could now be made with honey. Shunning sugar, which is still produced in conditions of exploitation, it's not a good crop, um, and the cultivation of which is not really environmentally friendly, it's not a good crop. Um, by using honey, we could, among other things, foster the ongoing attempts to protect diminishing stocks of pollinating bees. Um, if we had to put it on our ice cream, we might be more interested in doing that, right? And maybe we could have some distinctive Boston ice cream flavors. So brown bread. That's an ice cream flavor in England. If you've ever had brown bread ice cream, it's really rather nice. It's, it's thrifty, but it's also quite tasty. Um, it's very Bostonian. Easily adapted to our local food ways. Why not make Indian pudding into ice cream instead of serving the two together kind of inefficiently? Just put them together. Then on to Boston cream pie, right? Everyone's now hungry. <laughs> but maybe some more ad adventurous options. So baked bean ice cream. Bean ice cream is actually made in Asia. Beans are sweet. Chowder. <laughs> Dairy-based. OK. Succotash. Or my favorite, moxie, right? <laughs> From that take no prisoners New England soda, moxie ice cream. Anything, anything at all. But of course, tea. Tea ice cream is only fit for flinging into Boston Harbor. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, just uh, as a little context, I do have to say that uh, Christina's ice cream parlor in uh, Inman Square, I actually have had clam chowder ice cream that they made, uh, as well as they once made uh, Thanksgiving dinner ice cream, which was the entire Thanksgiving dinner pureed and put into ice cream. <laughs> it was not really meant to be more than a sample. This, this is the be careful what you wish for part of it. <laughs> so, 
Um, our next speaker, Michael Crondall, is a food writer, culinary historian, cooking teacher, and artist. He is the author of The Donut, History, Recipe, and Lore from Boston to Berlin, The Taste of Conquest, The Rise and Fall of the Great Cities of Spice, and Sweet Invention, A History of Dessert. Among his most recent project, um, our gig is the associate editor on the Oxford University Press Companion to Sweets, and as an editor of Savoring Gotham, a foodie uh, companion to New York City. So I, I, think, I think, first of all, I need to pivot from what is presumably an inessential food, which is ice cream, to an absolutely essential uh, staple of the New England diet, maybe donuts. Um, donuts do provide all the essential ingredients that you need. They have the carbohydrates, they have the fat. Um, and I guess if you put some cream filling in, they have some protein. Um, but, uh, so the essential, the, what I would like to describe as sort of Boston's major contribution to the American diet, which is, again, the, the donut. Um, briefly, donuts originate in Hertfordshire, in England, uh, sort of northeast of London, a fairly obscure specialty in the 18th century in England of Pretty well, nobody seemed to have known about it, but of course, that happened to be the area where many of the Puritans came from. So they brought that specialty with them. Uh, originally, these things were known as either Hertfordshire nuts. There's an 1750 recipe for that. Um, occasionally, Hertfordshire um, cushions because they would might be shaped in the shape of a dough nut, or rolled out and cut into squares, thus cushions. So they would rise like a cushion. Um, a yeast-based dough, um, you know, the obvious connection there is you have Hartford, Connecticut, Hartfordshire. Um, eventually they seem to be uh, known as doughnuts. More commonly there is a recipe from a manuscript cookbook from around 1800 where they are referred to doughnuts spelled D-O-W incidentally. Not spelling, the English and spelling, eh, never so good. And by the sort of the 1820s and 30s, you get lots of reports of them being served for Shrove Tuesday, Fat Tuesday. So they become very much part of the celebration of, um, or prior to the, I guess not the celebration of Lent, but the last uh, moment of excitement before Lent. Now, of course, when the Puritans got here, they didn't believe in holidays. Um, fun was not part of their description of what you were supposed to do. However, they did believe in donuts. Um, so instead of having donuts really as a special treat as you find in many European countries, and they are in fact typically associated with Fat Tuesday because at the end of winter you have all this lard, you have all this pork fat, and you have to do something with it because you can't eat it then throughout Lent. So lots of European cultures have these donut fests just prior to uh, Lent, but of course here, there seem to be lard year-round um, and no real reason to have to wait for that brief period, um, which is actually why I think that donuts are the quintessential American food, because they are this food, this special occasion, holiday, overindulgent food, which you would then recover from, right? But we don't do that. We have this overindulgent food day in and day out. And in New England, it would be for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, we have lots of reports of that. Um, there's all sorts of reliable references that sort of talk about donuts being around during the revolutionary era. Um, the very first um, literary reference is actually from the Boston Times in 1808 when they describe sitting around eating donuts with tea. <laughs> so you know that it was old. Um, my favorite, though, early reference is probably completely apocryphal, but it still makes it a good story. Apparently in, 18, in 1947, and this was an era where donut dunking was a national fad. But anyways, yes, there was. Uh, Martha Graham was part of the donut uh, dunking league. Zero Mostel was. Several senators, if I remember correctly, were as well. But anyways, um, there was a Boston milkman um, by the name of Paul Revere who was supposedly a descendant of the better known Paul Revere. Um, and he claimed that Paul Revere, his better, one, better known one, uh, introduced the 
a habit of donut dunking at a 1795 meeting of the Massachusetts Charitable Association at Boston's Green Dragon Tavern, which is incidentally where that famous ride started. And I always like to think that there was a few donuts dunked prior to the ride. <laughs> the British are coming and they're coming to get our donuts. Um, <laughs> That story was probably not true. However, uh, we do have other early donut references. I was um, sort of digging around and um, I came across something from the, uh, the 1827 Harvard Register, which immortalized donuts in poetry uh, in a poem called The New England Pastoral. And I will read you, it's only four lines. Full many a time my cooking powers I've tried and in the hissing fat have donuts fried. I'd rather Bo Moses kiss this rosy cheek than fry in hissing fat the donuts sleek. I assume he didn't want Moses to kiss his cheek and he didn't want to cook the donuts. That's my takeaway from this. Um, donuts were in fact eaten at breakfast, at lunch, and at dinner, and just to give you another example of roughly contemporary uh, story from the Boston Monthly uh, from 1826, I think it is. But anyways, um, you used to have all these stories about life in kind of the rural, rural, those quaint people in the rural areas. And here was a story about a schoolmaster who recounts visiting an unnamed town on the coast of an unnamed New England state. And he's invited to dinner and apparently served some inedible pork floating in fat, accompanied by donuts. He apparently wasn't too pleased by this. Someone had previously told me, by way of encouragement, that all schoolmasters lived up on the fat of the land. Alas, the ambiguity of the language. Till now, I had never understood this expression. On one corner of the table stood an article that would have staggered Helio, Heliogabalus. I had to look this one up. Heliogabalus was apparently a very gluttonous Roman emperor who was in power for all three years. But anyways, if you were uh, in Boston in 1826, presumably you knew who that was. Um, on one corner of the table stood an article that would have staggered Heliog, Heliogabulus. Sorry about that. Namely, a conical turret of donuts. This detestable esculent, the pride of our country dame, sometimes resembles one of your inflexible little soup dumplings. At others, it appears to be a kind of mongrel pancake. Um, donuts were so ubiquitous um, that people didn't necessarily always enjoy them because they were often just made with little leftovers of bread dough and they would be fried. And as you know, donuts aren't so good the next day. I mean, this dumping, dump, dumping, dunking thing goes back a long ways. Um, and there were a great number of them, and many, very often they were sort of eaten, um, they were given to travelers uh, as they were off on their way, because remember, they were nuts. They were, they were you know, this big. Um, and people would fill their pockets with them um, as a sort of New England pemmican, if you will. Um, there were all sorts of donut things um, in the 19th century. Um, some of them were, in fact, these doughnuts and often were referred to doughnuts. Occasionally, um, they'd be referred to as nut cakes from the doughnut. They'd be referred to as fry cakes. And um, apparently on Cape Cod, they were known as 74s, and nobody can figure out why they were called 74s. Um, so I found that in some dialect dictionary. Um, then at some point they started to make them actually donut shaped. And it's not entirely clear when this happened. Um, it may have been as early as 1830, I'll get to that in a moment, but the original donuts were made with a yeast dough. So if you think of a risen donut, uh, kind of think Krispy Kreme, I guess. Um, so they would have been risen. And then because uh, typically Americans were in a hurry and yeast takes a while to do its thing, and it was fiddly, and you had to have it soured because people didn't just have yeast 
that they could pick up at the local uh, stop and shop. Um, they developed this idea of making cake donuts with various predecessors to baking soda. The thing with the cake donuts, though, is they were very, very sweet. Um, the yeast donuts, you couldn't put too much sugar in them because the yeast wouldn't do its thing. But now they could put lots and lots of sugar into them. And by the mid-19th century, sugar is relatively cheap in America. But the problem is that also in America, things get bigger. So you start off with the little nuts, but they get a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. And by the time you have a larger sort of a donut size shaped, and you make it with cake batter, drop it in the fat. By the time the outside cooks, the inside is not cooked yet. And if you cook a little bit longer, the outside burns because of the sugar. So clearly somebody figured out, OK, if we poke out that middle that doesn't cook, we'll um, have a donut. We'll have something that now we call donuts, right? Except they didn't call them donuts at the time. They called them jumbles. Because jumbles were a term used for cookies, ring-shaped cookies. And consequently, they start calling them jumbles because they were round. And there is a very early mention from 1830. Um, oh, incidentally, the very first cookbook, of course, Boston-based. Um, Lydia Maria Child's A Frugal Housewife from um, 1829 was the first one, uh, cookbook to have cake donuts in it. But at any rate, um, by 1830, there is an article uh, in the Boston Courier that talks about something called a nut cake, alias a donut, alias a symbol in fashionable parlance. So it may well be that we had donuts as early as 1830. A little bit unclear. There's definitely a recipe by the time we get to um, 1846. And there's also a story, which given the time, I won't get into too much details. But there's a story reported in 1916. That is 70 years afterwards, right, in the Boston Post about a certain New Hampshire captain who is claiming that he invented the donut hole. Uh, and if I might point out, um, he's 85 at the time, and he is a sailor. And sailors are not known exactly for their reliability in telling tales. Uh, if you want to know more about this, you can, of course, look it up in Wikipedia, how um, Hanson Gregory invented the donut hole. Um, now, given the time, I think I'm going to fast forward um, about 100 years um, from 1847 to 1947, or maybe a little bit earlier than that, uh, one of Boston's great entrepreneurs was a fellow by the name of uh, William Rosenberg, uh, who grew up in Dorchester. Poor kid, poor Jewish kid, father was a grocer, um, didn't have a penny to their name, grew up in the Depression. Eventually, he gets a job uh, working for an ice cream company. There's connections throughout all this. Uh, working for an ice cream company, uh, riding around um, all over Boston. Apparently, he was very good at it. Uh, convinced all the kids to eat his ice cream. That inessential thing <laughs> <laughs> that kids need to eat. Um, so he rode around. Um, eventually, this ice cream truck turns into a company with food trucks. Nothing is new. As you well know, right? So there were lots of food trucks. It's just that they were not catering to hipsters. Um, they were catering to factory workers in those days. And he figures out at a certain point that he's making most of his money on coffee and donuts. Something like 40% of his profit is coming from those two items. And so he thinks, well, coffee, donuts, they're cheap, both of them, as you well know if you walk into a Starbucks. Uh, they're just printing money. And he discovered he could do the same thing. So he eventually opens up in Quincy, a place called Open Kettle. And here's a problem. He says it was in 1950. And the Dunkin' Donuts website will tell you it was 1948. Now, I still don't know who to believe. I, my tendency is to believe the founder of the company over the company, which doesn't seem to know anything about his history, incidentally. But anyways, he opens a place called Open Kettle. And his sort of stroke of genius, and we go back to ice cream, is that um, Hojo, the first 
Howard Johnson's is also in Quincy. And Howard Johnson's kind of innovated this idea of having lots and lots of different flavors of ice cream available at any given time. And at the time, you really only could get like four kinds of donuts in a donut shop. You would have um, plain cake, you'd get jelly, you'd get a yeast raised donut, or you'd get a crawler. That was pretty well it. So he thought, well, if Howard Johnson's can have whatever it was, 28 flavors, I think it was at the time, um, flavors of ice cream, we could have as many kinds of donuts. And so this innovation started this. He also put a counter because previous donut shops didn't have counters, so people could sit. And he incidentally also put pretty young women behind the counter um, so that people would want to sit there. And they also rolled them by hand in those days so that people would come by and they would roll them in the window. So people would see them rolling the donuts and they would be super fresh. Uh, how are we doing on time? I should probably finish here. In um, either 1951 or 1950, depending on who you believe, um, he changed the name to Dunkin' Donuts because he was at some meeting of uh, the company and uh, they were people coming up with different names, different names. They came up with Mr. Donut. And then somebody came up with this idea of like, well, what do you do with Dunkin', uh, Donuts? Uh, you dunk them. This wasn't much after that Dunkin' uh, craze. So changed the name to Dunkin' Donuts and the rest was history. By the way, he broke up with his partner at one point and the partner took the name. Mr. Donut, which still exists in Asia, for what that's worth. So we come back to you know an essential of the New England diet um, that we certainly cannot live without. <laughs> So uh, our final panelist uh, this evening will be Carla Martin. Uh, she is the founder and executive director of the Fine Cacao and Chocolate Institute and a lecturer in the Department of African American uh, Studies at Harvard University. Her work at uh, the FCCI focuses on identifying, developing, and promoting fine cacao and chocolate, primarily by addressing ethics and quality issues in the supply chain. A social, social anthropologist, her current research focuses on the politics of cacao and chocolate in a global perspective. So I think we have to wait one second for the screen. There we are. Perfect. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm very happy to be joining you all tonight. And I actually want to take us outside of Boston for just a moment to go to the origins of cacao. And I suspect that many of you might already be familiar, but perhaps some of you aren't. And in fact, cacao's genetic origins, cacao being the raw material that becomes chocolate, are in the Amazon River Basin, which you can see illustrated here, covered by that orange circle. And cacao's cultural center of diversity is what we know of today as Mexico and Central America or Mesoamerica. And you can see that in that sort of oblong yellow shape uh, further up on the map there. Um, at the same time, cacao has now come to be grown throughout the world, especially uh, between the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn, 20 degrees north and south of the equator. And it is, in fact, important that we understand this because chocolate, as we know it today, is just one recipe out of hundreds or thousands thousands from the Mesoamerican part of the world that came to be popular and adopted by Europeans and North Americans and consumed in large quantities. And it is in fact an ingredient that is enormously global and that we only make local by manufacturing and eating here. So one of the ways that we can study the history of cacao and chocolate is by looking at interesting historical documents. On the left here, you see the Dresden Codex, which is written in Maya hieroglyph, and it contains a great deal of information about the ritualistic significance of cacao to the Maya people. The Popol Vuh is another uh, very popular document to study about the history of cacao and chocolate. And in it, it actually records the origin myth of the Maya people who 
believed themselves to be born of the cacao and maize gods, and talked also about the sacred nature of the cacao tree, believing that uh, the roots of the tree linked them with the underworld, uh, the trunk of the tree linked them with the present day, and that the leaves and the branches of the tree would link them with future lives or the afterlife. And we also were able to study all of this by looking at uh, some of the ceramic vessels that have survived into the present day. And uh, one of them is this one here, the Rio Azul Cacao Funerary Vessel, which would have been buried with a noble person in uh, what is today Guatemala. And they were able to identify that this contained cacao because it, it actually has the cacao hieroglyph in Maya writing on the outside. And in addition, they did a chemical analysis, took a scraping from the inside, and were able to determine that it contained both caffeine and theobromine. And cacao is the only plant in South America that contains both of those compounds. So if you're interested in this type of ceramic vessel, here in the Boston area, we're lucky to have a rich uh, set to look at. You can find them at the Museum of Fine Arts, at the Museum of Science, at their current chocolate exhibit, and also at Harvard's Peabody Museum. So there's a lot to look at there. In addition to being used for ritual and for social and recipe development, cacao was also and perhaps primarily used as a currency. It was quite literally the money that grew on trees. And it was what attracted the Spanish early on to cacao um, when they were first beginning to colonize Mesoamerica. And this slide just gives you a sense of what you could get for one cocoa bean. You could buy 20 small tomatoes. For 65 cocoa beans, you could get a cotton cape. There were even important distinctions between high quality cocoa, which would buy you something uh, for a better value, and low quality cocoa. So if your cocoa was moldy or insect infested or flat or unfermented, it had less value. And this is really significant the Spanish, in fact, extracted wealth to the tunes of uh, millions of cocoa beans over the period of several decades using enforced indigenous labor. Uh, and this was an enormous part of how they came to colonize Mesoamerica. How many of you have ever seen a cacao tree in person? I'm just curious. OK, a few lucky people here. I've put up an image just so you can get a sense. They're a quite alien structure. I'm going to let that just ring. Okay, uh, and they exhibit what is known as cauliflory. So they're a tree that fruits from the trunk, as opposed to many of the fruit trees we tend to see here in New England that fruit from the lighter, more fragile branches. And they um, grow in the, the rainforest's understory. And uh, what they produce is a fruit that looks a lot like a Nerf football or cacao pods. When you harvest these, you then cut into them, often using a machete or smashing them on a stone. And what you find inside is a fruit, a mucilaginous pulp, as it's often described by scientists, that covers the seeds of the cacao pod. And the seeds are what go on to become chocolate. But first, you have to ferment them. And this is a sort of controlled rotting process that traditionally would have been done wrapped up in banana leaves. You need to then dry them in the sun. And all of these processes are the way in which cacao and chocolate flavor come to develop. Without doing them at origin, uh, we will not have the flavors that we know of as chocolate. You then need to roast the seeds, and in doing that, you actually uh, cause uh, Maillard reactions to occur and develop more chocolate flavor. You then take the shells off. The shells are sort of garbage that you can then use as mulch in your garden, for example, and then grind them. And we were very lucky to see a matate upstairs earlier tonight. Uh, traditionally, this is the way that chocolate making would have been done. It is still a popular way of making chocolate throughout Mesoamerica. Now, after all of that, you can end up with chocolate in a place like Boston. And this is one of my favorite early examples of chocolate being mentioned by Samuel Sewall, one of our sort of founding fathers, who wrote in his diary in 1697, I wait on the lieutenant governor at Dorchester and there meet with Mr. Tory. 
We breakfast together on venison and chocolate. I said, Massachusetts and Mexico meet at his honors table. And so this is one of the interesting things. These early chocolate recipes were often used as breakfast accompaniments. But what I find especially interesting about it is that Samuel Sewall was aware of the provenance of his food. He knew that his venison came from Massachusetts. He knew, in this case, that his chocolate came from Mexico. If I were ask, and to ask any of you to pick up a piece of chocolate today and know where it came from, chances are you would not. So this is a major change. Um, in addition, early colonial European and American uh, fans of chocolate did a great deal to sort of snobify it through their material culture. And a couple of my favorite examples of this are the Spanish Manzarina. It is a saucer with a cup holder on the inside. You could place a cup of dark drinking chocolate into it and carry it. If you had shaky hands, you would be less likely to spill it. You could be jostled about at a party and you wouldn't ruin the front of your beautiful outfit. Um, American chocolate uh, pots were also another very important uh, way of both capturing wealth in the form of silver and then passing it on through families, and of course displaying wealth uh, at different moments. And this is an example from the Mun Museum of Fine Arts here in Boston. Uh, and then, of course, in the 16 and 1700s in Britain, and then also here in Boston, it became popular to form coffee and chocolate houses, which were places that served these beverages as an alternative to the other common drink of the day, which was often alcoholic. And in Boston in 1670, in fact, Dorothy Jones and Jane Barnard were known to have successfully petitioned the city to keep a house of public entertainment for the selling of coffee, and as they wrote it then, chocolate which was a unique example of women taking an entrepreneurial role. These were often spaces that were primarily frequented by men, and they became spaces that were hotbeds of political discussion and, and activity. In Britain, it was not uncommon that the nobility would try to shut these coffee houses down because people would get together and discuss all sorts of dangerous ideas about things like democracy. And interestingly, coffee houses to this day remain important spaces of political discussion. Colonial American chocolate we've already touched on. One of the first chocolate makers is from the Lower Mills, Neponset River, Dorchester, Milton region, and that is the Walter Baker, or what is now known as the Walter Baker Company, which of course you know if you've ever bought those very bitter uh, dark chocolate baking squares at a Shaw's or a Stop and Shop, and you can still go and visit many of their spaces today. Um, but much of this increasing in the popularity of chocolate and the democratization of chocolate relied on continued growth in supply of cacao, that raw material. And it's important to keep in mind that it was the transatlantic slave trade and the global uh, capitalist system that developed as a result of all of this that allowed people to have increasing access to cacao, to chocolate, and to sugar, these main ingredients. In addition, industrialization, the mechanization of chocolate grinding, the change from a matate to something that could produce chocolate involving less labor and at scale uh, through melangeurs was an enormously important development in chocolate production. And the development of the hydraulic press, which is a machine that will take that original chocolate paste and press it with enormous pressure to have two resulting uh, sub-ingredients of chocolate liquor, and those are cocoa butter and and cocoa powder, which can then be repurposed in different ways, were also important to the widespread of chocolate and its popularity. And then, of course, the spread of chocolate into North American homes was often done through domestic science, through home economics, and through cookbooks, such as this one, The Chocolate and Cocoa Recipes by Miss Parloa. Uh, and this was a partnership between Miss Parloa and the Walter Baker Company, uh, a very popular cookbook that included many recipes for chocolate and cocoa candies and baked goods, and then of course the Fanny Farmer Boston cooking book, uh, which contained in the early 1900s one of the first recipes for brownies and was a way of attracting American housewives to using chocolate in their baked goods. 
Uh, North America, at the same time as chocolate was becoming democratized in this way, was also becoming a sort of candy land. And here in the Boston area, we've already heard about many of the different candy companies that existed that were using uh, different cocoa and chocolate products in their ingredients. And they included other companies like Royal, Cole, Haviland, Liberty, and Traffs and Necco, of course. And they were candies like Junior Mints, Charleston Chews, Sugar Daddies, Necco Wafers, and Tootsie Rolls. But as time went on and industrialization increased, um, the ability to scale up the manufacturing and sourcing process, the retail process, uh, it became possible, for example, to move chocolate to places that previously had been too hot and where it would have melted, um, to do this with increased uh, transportation ability. All of this has led to the aggregation of many of these original small candy companies, and they're being bought up by some of what are now known as the big five chocolate companies. <laughs> And these include Cadbury, which is now owned um, technically by Kraft, an American company, though originally it was British, Ferrero, Nestle, Hershey's, and Mars. And just to give you a sense of how significant the footprint of these companies is, when you have <coughs> Halloween candy, 99.9% .9 of bite-sized chocolate candies in the United States are produced by two companies, Hershey's and Mars. So these are really massive corporations at this point. World cocoa production has likewise had a massive demographic shift. And rather than co cocoa being produced primarily in Mesoamerica and South America, it is now most largely produced in West and Central Africa, which produce about 72 to 75 percent of the world's cacao, those raw materials. And to give you a sense of the inequality that exists between cocoa production and chocolate consumption, Africans actually only consume about 4 percent of the world's chocolate. And in fact, Europeans and North Americans consume 75% of the world's chocolate while producing none of the world's cacao. And that, I think, gives you a sense of how these trade patterns came to be and how globally there is now great inequality in where value is captured in this supply chain. Uh, in addition, we have had increasingly a disconnect throughout the supply chain between consumers and producers. So Samuel Sewell knew that his chocolate might have come from Mexico, but the average consumer today is unaware of this, and the average cacao producer, likewise, does not know where their cacao goes and what it is turned into. Uh, they have very little insight into the supply chain overall. And one of the things that plays out here is that farmers have been increasingly learning less, earning less profit over the past 30 years or so, to the point that now about far farmers tend to get about 3 to 6% of the overall value of a chocolate bar, whereas the majority of that value is caught within the retail and supermarket margin and within production costs. So again, this original inequality in cacao and chocolate production and consumption is playing out in sharp relief today. And so when you hear about things like cacao, cacao and chocolate might be in great danger, what you're hearing about is the fact that many cacao producers are quitting. Only about 25% of cacao producers are interested in having their children go on to produce cacao. Now, one of the ways that companies have attempted to resolve these problems is by looking at alternative trade models. And they've done this through things like fair trade certification or Rainforest Alliance. And I'm sure that many of you see these symbols on the shelves in supermarkets. But in fact, two of the pioneers in ethical sourcing are from Massachusetts. One of them is Equal Exchange, which focuses on fairly traded coffee, chocolate, sugar, nuts, bananas and other ingredients and they have for the past several decades been working very closely with cacao producers I've had the opportunity to work closely with them and the amount of effort that they put into supporting farmer cooperatives is really unprecedented in the chocolate industry they are based in West Bridgewater Massachusetts that's where they roast their coffee and Taza chocolate is another important pioneer in this space they're a much younger company founded in the mid 2000s but they have pioneered 
direct trade cacao sourcing. And what this means is that they negotiate directly with farmer cooperatives or exporters, and they actually publish a transparency report every year where they indicate how much cacao they've bought, where they bought it from, and what they paid for it. And they pay well above the bulk commodity for price for cacao each year. So there's a lot of potential in their potential in their model to have impact that is beneficial to farmers. In addition, they are part of a larger movement that has involved a sort of romantic return to chocolate's more delicious roots. And that is chocolate that is darker and more bittersweet and that uses uh, vintage equipment to produce in small batches using single origin cacao. And that means that you might taste a bar with beans from Madagascar and have a different flavor experience than a bar with beans from the Dominican Republic. And this started in the 1970s and 1980s in Europe with French companies Valrona and Bona, an Italian company Domori, and also here in Massachusetts, we are home to many of the pioneers in this space. In the early 2000s uh, in North America, this type of chocolate was really in the single digits. And one of the sort of original companies that many of you might be familiar with is Scharfenberger. They are now owned by Hershey's. Uh, DeVries Chocolate is another now defunct company, but all of these other companies listed here, Rogue Chocolatier, Somerville Chocolate, Chiquesset Chocolate, Goodnow Farms Chocolate, Vivre Chocolate, and Boho Chocolate are based in Massachusetts. Rogue Chocolatier, in fact, is widely considered one of the best chocolate makers in the country, but is a very small company producing about 6,000 bars of chocolate per year, and they're bars that might come with a bit of sticker shock, depending on what you're used to. They sell for about $18 for two ounces. Now, if you're interested to learn more about any of this, I can't resist giving some reading recommendations. Uh, the True History of Chocolate is one of the key texts that you can look at to learn more about this. In addition, The New Taste of Chocolate by Maricel Persia is, uh, if you had time for one book on chocolate, I would recommend this one, plus it comes with recipes. And then, of course, there's Sidney Mintz's Sweetness and Power, which is a book about sugar, but it's really the best book there is about chocolate. And that's because there's so much that is similar between the two crops. And then finally, if you would like to get your chocolate fix here in the Boston area, these are some of my favorites. And it's important to be aware that there are different types of chocolate companies. There are companies called chocolate makers that actually buy beans and turn them into chocolate. And these are companies like Rogue Chocolatier, Somerville Chocolate, and Taza Chocolate. You can actually go and tour Somerville Chocolate and Taza Chocolate and have that rare experience of seeing the manufacturing process at work. There are then chocolatiers who are also derisively referred to as melters in the industry. What that means is that they take pre-existing chocolate and melt it into other things like ganaches or truffles. And they are companies like Gaté Comme des Filles in Somerville, EH Chocolatier also in Somerville, and LA Burdick Chocolate in Boston and Cambridge. And then finally, there are a number of specialty retail shops like Beacon Hill Chocolates, Cardulos, and Formaggio Kitchen. And those are the places that I recommend to go if you want to try something really special. So thank you. I think we have time for a few questions, if anyone has any. Uh, Peter Drummy has a microphone, and he'll pass it around. Um, so that because we're filming, we're going to ask you if you have a question to come up and ask at the microphone. <coughs> so, anyone brave enough to ask a question? All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering, Dunkin' Donuts, donuts and coffee, coffee beans, they come from that same region of the country as cocoa beans, the, the first thing you show. Well, for, the mat, for that matter, there's cocaine too, but we don't have to get into that. Uh, but I'm wondering, did the, did the cocoa beans and the caffeine beans come in the same shipment? I mean, wasn't there a little bit of, uh, uh, not collusion, but you know, didn't they, weren't they, didn't they come in the same package? <laughs> 
In fact, uh, shipping just logistically cocoa and coffee together is frowned upon. And that's because cocoa is enormously absorbent and will pick up coffee smell by being with it. But you're absolutely right that these are crops that tend to be grown in similar parts of the world. And in fact, with climate change, a lot of traditionally coffee farmers are now switching over to cocoa. Um, and many of the supply chain networks that existed involved transporting sugar, coffee, cocoa, uh, tobacco, all of these crops. So it's absolutely the case that many of the same traders or purveyors of these crops uh, would have been trading in coffee and cocoa. And, and are caffeine beans of a similar, aren't they related to cocoa beans? They're related in that they provide a sort of stimulus when you consume them. Uh, but interestingly, uh, coffee beans uh, originate in Ethiopia, so they spread from uh, a very different origin than cacao, which originates in the Amazon River Basin. Mm -hmm. So there are um, other crops which come from warmer climes. And here in the New World, we're really taken with them, tomatoes and potatoes and eggplants and peppers and all the things in the Solanum family. We can grow those here. Uh, we can grow them in giant hoop houses. Is there any movement to grow cacao in, in, under glass or in hoop houses so we could grow it more locally? It, that's such an interesting question. Uh, it doesn't do so well. It's a really picky crop. Um, it likes to grow with buddy trees that are much taller, and um, it's also very picky about the right amount of wind and circulation to avoid disease. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are interested to see one in a glass enclosure, they have one at Smith College in their greenhouse. So it's it's not impossible. I, I've even seen one in Iceland. Um, they they where where it's so it's not uncommon in, in sort of botanical gardens. To, to find an example of cacao. Um, but it, it also at the same time, it's a relatively inefficient crop. And so you would need to plant vast orchards of it under glass in order to get the amount of chocolate that we like to consume. So yeah, I mean, maybe in the future that might be see something that we see. They're now apart. growing cacao in Hawaii. It's quite popular. Uh, it's a little bit too cold there for it, so they go through all kinds of mechanis mechanizations to try to keep it warm enough. Yeah. All right, something to think about, huh? <laughs> too cold. I'm fascinated, or I, to be reawoken to thinking in terms of the triangular slave trade and our fascination with sweets. So I guess my question really is, can you really see a pattern with those ports on the East Coast that were engaged in slave trade and the types of food we consume? And on the other end over in Liverpool, was there an equal sweets industry? Yes, definitely. I mean, the sweet tooth is not American. Um, it is early modern Euro-American. Um, nearly every place that had connections to the West Indies and can buy the sugar, they do it. Um, the taste spreads. Um, there's something probably apocryphal that Russian aristocrats in the, in the 18th century artificially blackened their teeth so they resembled French aristocrats. Um, so <laughs> I don't know if that's actually true, um, but the French aristocrats could get the sugar and had terrible teeth, um, and so the Russians wanted to indicate they didn't get as much sugar. But I mean, if you look at a lot of Europe, um, you can detect patterns of preparing food and eating that go well back into 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, where people are drinking chocolate, um, uh, chocolate was approved for Lent, for instance, going back to what you can or can't eat um, during religious holidays. Uh, they had to deliberate on that. Um, and there are chocolate drinking cultures throughout Southern Europe. So, so sugar, yeah, sugar eventually gets everywhere. Anyone can import it from the West Indies. And the Dutch were slave traders. They well, were early everyone was slave, slave traders. traders. <laughs> I mean, we, you're seeing a real connection? Yes, I mean, um, I mean, the connection can be very, very, very direct um, in terms of the nation that is involved with the slave right. trade and then has the colonies that are producing the commodities produced by slave labor. But there's a knock-on effect. So it's not as if people in Boston were 
um, uh, necessarily trading the slaves that go to these plantations, but they're involved in collateral trades that support. Yeah. And that's why I said, you know, the hemispheric kind of circulation. And yes, I, I really endorse um, this uh, recommendation of Sidney Mintz's book, Sweetness and Power, which is still the essential text that talks about that. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if um, in the same uh, lane of thought as the ice cream and the ice cream parlors and um, how that was associated with respectability for women, if there is a similar association with chocolate, um, with respectability, status, even whiteness, if there is an um, awareness of it being from an exotic place, um, if, if that was also a thing, yeah. You could probably answer this just as well, but uh, they uh, absolutely. Um, there were all sorts of stories that you can read about women consuming chocolate in uh, the 16, 1700s, where there were concerns about it being aphrodisiac. Uh, there were all, all sorts of bizarre stories too. There was one woman who gave birth to a baby who uh, was born, stillborn, and was entirely blackened, and they blamed it upon her vast consumption of chocolate. So all kinds of things like that that you'll hear about. Um, and historically, too, there were all kinds of things going on where people were both acknowledging the exotic roots of chocolate and neglecting them. And so it wasn't uncommon for people to talk about the dark or bittersweet nature of the chocolate they were consuming, often associating it with, um, with evil or with sexiness or these sort of uh, lascivious qualities, uh, while also then associating things like vanilla with whiteness or squareness, as we might put it in sort of colloquial terms. Terms. So there's always been a relationship between this kind of specter of the history of slavery, of the exotic conditions of production, uh, this kind of global connection with the crop, and a notion of whiteness or white supremacy as well. I don't know if you want to add to that, Tracy. Well, I think a lot depends on um, what liquor is doing <laughs> in, in whatever scenario there is. I mean, it is very unusual during the early modern period that taverns are considered places that women can go to, and that's just fine. Coffee houses, on the other hand, are where men are arguing about politics, and women are not supposed to go there. Um, and so drinking coffee, tea, chocolate seems to be a kind of nice household thing um, that ladies and gentlemen can do together, and there's a kind of a civility that goes with that. Um, Ice cream parlors, in a sense, rise in popularity during temperance and prohibition, uh, when drinking alcohol is no longer thought of as just kind of an everyday thing. It's another form of food <laughs> to drink beer. Um, uh, and instead, the, the taverns um, and uh, other establishments that serve liquor are now associated with rough male activities, um, and women should not go there alone. And ice cream parlors are public establishments where they usually serve other kinds of food as well, and a woman can go there, and no one's going to suspect her of anything, whereas going into a tavern is a completely different business. I, I also think that it's, it's important not to forget that there's a class dimension to <coughs> chocolate up until about, let's say, the 1850s or so, but maybe even mm. a little bit after that. So when you talk about women drinking chocolate, and they were very much in particularly in um, continental Europe, chocolate was very much associated with upper class, aristocratic women, uh, the sort of thing that women would serve at the salon, you know, in the age of reason as they were entertaining Voltaire and whoever. Um, that chocolate was extraordinarily expensive. Um, so if they were shipping it along with the coffee, coffee was relatively cheap. Because of the way it grows, it's just basically berries you pick off of the tree, whereas Chocolate involves an extremely complex process of processing it. Um, so chocolate was vastly more expensive than coffee, um, thus much more of an aristocratic drink than coffee or certainly tea later on, because tea, again, is relatively cheap. You know, you don't need to sell that much opium to get a lot of tea back. Um, so that class dimension and that gender dimension is huge to chocolate. And by the time you get into the 19th century, and the United States, 
chocolate, particularly chocolates, are associated with things French. Uh, and one of the funny things about La Belle Chocolatière, who was the, uh, what is she, the mascot, <laughs> the mascot of bakers, is that um, she's been given this French name, but in fact, she was apparently, you know, painted by a German artist uh, and was depicting a Swiss uh, waitress, but here she was known as La Belle Chocolatière because it was, because it was the French who really you guys sort of um, dominated fine uh, confectionery in the early 19th century. But it was also a little bit risque. The French weren't, you know, particularly Puritan New England didn't sort of think too highly of the French. Um, and it was only later when Baker sort of convinced by a massive advertising campaign um, that chocolate, the drink, was something that was appropriate for children, that in the late 19th century you find, you know, cocoa, hot cocoa being associated with childhood. Mind you, childhood was invented in the 19th century too, so. <laughs> okay, well, um, I would just like to, to wrap up by saying I think clearly the only ethical thing to do is to eat donuts, uh, <laughs> except that you should also be eating large <laughs> amounts of ice cream to compete with other cities. Uh, but, uh, I'd like to thank our, our panelists, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Um, and I, there are some books for sale in the lobby, and I hope you all have a nice day. <laughs> On that note, thank you very much. <laughs>